I'm Robert Boyd. I uh, thank the organizers of this meeting for this opportunity for me to be with you today. I'm from the University of Ottawa and the University of Rochester. I'm going to talk to you uh, this morning about this fascinating field of quantum imaging. And let me just point out here that uh, the visuals of this talk, in fact, all my talks are available on my website in case anybody is interested. So let me start off with a brief uh, outline of what uh, I want to accomplish in this half an hour. So first of all, I'm going to give a brief introduction to quantum imaging to tell you what it is and what it's trying to do. We'll then talk about quantum super resolution. We'll talk about quantum aberration correction and quantum ghost imaging. So uh, quantum, quantum imaging, what, what is quantum imaging? Excuse me just one second. Uh, Zoom is giving me a hard time. So uh, what do we mean by quantum imaging? Well, the goal of quantum imaging is to produce better uh, images using quantum methods. What do we mean by better? Well, perhaps we can form an image with a smaller number of photons. Perhaps we can achieve better spatial resolution or perhaps we can achieve better signal to noise ratio. So that's the goal. Uh, from the library point of view, uh, what we're doing, quantum imaging exploits the quantum properties of the transverse structure of light fields. So uh, let me just give you an example of, of uh, quantum imaging. It's called quantum lithography. I think it captures uh, uh, a lot of the essence of uh, how quantum imaging works. So uh, the idea is that entangled photons can be used to form an interference pattern with detail finer than the Rayleigh limit. And this uh, resolution keeps scaling with the number of entangled photons. So here's a conceptual picture of how this works. A uh, laser beam falls onto a down conversion crystal. Uh, two photons are emitted. They are indistinguishable photons. It's a, uh, a requirement. The two photons then meet on a 50-50 beam splitter. And by the, uh, the nature of the uh, beam splitter transmission and reflection coefficients, it turns out that 50% of the time, both photons end up here. Half the time, both photons here, but you never get one photon here and one photon here. What you do then is you let the two beams interfere with one another on a recording medium that works by two photon absorption we get an interference pattern, but it's not a classical interference pattern. It's the probability amplitude of two photon absorption, both photons coming through this arm, interfering with two photon absorption, both photons coming from this arm here. So uh, to date, uh, uh, there have been no practical uh, implementations, but there's some very intriguing laboratory results. So uh, in one, uh, demonstration done in my lab. Uh, here is the classical uh, interference pattern. So uh, just by using laser light and not using uh, down conversion. But then when we look at the interference pattern in the quantum case using the two uh, uh, indistinguishable photons, we see that the period becomes half as large, the spatial frequency becomes twice as large, uh, potentially giving you an increase in the spatial resolution in the case of, of lithography, allowing you to write uh, smaller features. Now, uh, with that very brief introduction, let's move on to what we mean by quantum super resolution. So the uh, question that I'll ask is, what does quantum mechanics have to say about our ability to achieve super resolution? Well, I guess the first question is, what do we mean by super resolution? Well, we will take it to mean achieving spatial resolution in an imaging system that exceeds the Rayleigh or the Abbe uh, criterion. So uh, let, let's talk about the uh, Rayleigh criterion. Uh, what uh, Rayleigh said is that uh, uh, in, in order to resolve, well, let's think of stars, in order to resolve two stars, the angular separation of stars must be greater than 1.22 lambda divided by d, where d is the diameter of the collecting aperture. And here's a, a just simple picture here. If the two stars are 
separated by more than this. You can see two of them. If they're right at the limit that Rayleigh really proposed, you can just barely think that maybe it is, maybe it isn't resolved. And if you go to considerably smaller than this distance, it is not resolved. Okay, so uh, next thing I want to talk to you about is mode decomposition and its, uh, its uh, use in, uh, in imaging. Well, it's most natural to perform imaging in coordinate space. That is to say, we measure the intensity as a function of position. But there's an alternative way that we can do imaging, and that is to uh, decompose the, uh, the light field into any complete orthogonal basis set. And particular, of particular interest are the Hermit Gauss modes and the Laguerre Gauss modes. Now, why would we want to do this? Well, there, there are some advantages. Uh, first of all, often a small number of parameters can be used to characterize an image. And we know this by the compression methods that are used to send uh, images over the internet. Uh, also, techniques exist for characterizing and manipulating Laguerre Gauss modes and, and Hermit Gauss modes. So it's a very friendly uh, set of modes to work with. And finally, is that this mode decomposition can be used to achieve super resolution. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. How, how, how do we achieve super resolution in this manner? So uh, Manke Tsang, uh, a few years ago, came up with a proposal for how to do this. So uh, in fact, they, uh, they talk about this as Rayleigh's curse. Uh, uh, Rayleigh's curse is that you cannot achieve a resolution better than 1.22 lambda over D, where D is the diameter of the collecting aperture. But they go on to show in this paper of theirs that this limitation is not fundamental. It's because uh, people tend to measure the intensity distribution of the light in the image plane. If instead one were to measure the complex field amplitude, there is, in concept, no limitation. Uh, to, to the spatial resolution that one can achieve. Now, but how to do this? Well, they show that uh, if, uh, if we do a mode decomposition of the field and measure the amplitudes of each of these modes, then we can also overcome the, uh, uh, we can also overcome the uh, Rayleigh criterion. Now, uh, their results are shown here. This is the normalized Fisher information plus as a function of normalized distance. Let's ignore what's at the top for right now. Let's look at the bottom. This is the Fisher information for measurements to measure the separation between two sources. For direct imaging, uh, direct imaging is, is this measuring intensity as a function of position. You see that the Fisher information drops to zero for a small separations of, of, of the two objects. Uh, that we sort of expected, but what is a bit surprising is that the quantum optimal uh, does not drop as the separation goes to zero. It is just as easy to measure a separation between two objects that are very close together as it is to two objects that are very far apart. And of course, this is one of those theories that tells you it's possible. It doesn't necessarily tell you how to do it. So uh, many people have become interested in this. Uh, first of all, Mackey Tseng calls this procedure SPADE because it stands for spatial mode decomposition. And uh, it's been confirmed by several workers. Uh, two of these three groups are from Canada. Uh, they did this for transverse resolution. But what about axial resolution? This is also important. If you want the full three-dimensional nature of the field, you need both the transverse and the longitudinal. So my students and I got to work on uh, applying uh, the uh, SPADE uh, procedure to axial resolution. And this paper got published in Optica uh, about a year ago. So uh, uh, what can I say? First of all, uh, here's just a conceptual picture for direct imaging. Here you have the object that you want to measure. You uh, collect the light and you focus it down on a camera. What we did instead was use a sorter-based imaging. You collect the light and then you send it to a mode sorter. And each of the modes leaving this object are, is sent uh, to a different detector. 
So uh, here is a theory plot. Again, this is the Fisher information plot as a function of separation. And once again, for direct imaging, the uh, Fisher information drops to zero at small separations. Uh, once again, this horizontal line here is the quantum Fisher information. It does not drop at all. But then how, the question is, in the laboratory, how close can you get to it? Well, if you have an ideal sorter, that means it sorts every one of the modes, or at least every one of the populated modes uh, that's present in the image, you get this result here. We instead use what's called a binary sorter, and this works, it really works very well, although not, uh, does not achieve the, the optimum. Uh, what do I mean by a binary sorter? Well, our binary sorter separates the modes into the even order radial modes and the odd order uh, ra radial modes. This is possible because in the past several years, people have developed methods for, for measuring the radial structure of a, for example, the Gauss mode. So here's our experimental setup. Uh, we uh, form the object here. We use a spatial light -like modulator to uh, uh, synthesize a, uh, a star, a, uh, a uh, source with thermal statistics, and the two of them are mutually incoherent with respect to one another. We can measure this uh, uh, object by two different ways. We have the direct imaging method, which we can slide in and out, and we have the binary sorter that, that we can slide in and out. And we use the spatial like modulators to impress holograms to diffract a certain mode into a certain direction. And here are the results. So uh, in this column here, we, uh, we have the measured separation. In this column here, we have the standard deviation of the measurement. We do it both for direct imaging and for sorter-based imaging. And you see that with the exception of a little region here, both of these methods uh, are uh, reliable. They, they, uh, they plot the measured separation as a function of the actual separation along a straight line that, except here, goes to the origin. What's of interest to us right now is the standard deviation of the measurement. So uh, here is the sorter-based imaging, and you see that at uh, a very small separation, the uh, standard deviation is about three in these normalized units. But when we do this using direct imaging, the, uh, uh, at, at small separations, the, the standard deviation is about seven in these units. So uh, we, we have a factor of two improvement in the standard deviation, a factor of two improvement in the ability to measure the actual separation uh, in the uh, presence of things like quantum noise. So to, to summarize this, uh, so Manke Tseng's spade method can lead to a factor of two increased accuracy in determining the separation of two point sources. But the question remains, can this method be applied to the task of increasing the sharpness of more complicated images, natural images? So in one sense, you say, gee, an image, if you know all the separations between all the points in the image, uh, you could maybe be smart enough to synthesize the, the, the actual image. So that's what people are, are working on uh, today. Okay, let me go to the next topic. This is quantum non-local aberration correction. And just to motivate this, the question is, can a wavefront corrector paste, placed in the idler path correct for aberrations in the signal path? And I, I'm thinking that we are measuring now in coincidence. So here conceptually, and it's actually pretty close to the actual experiment, here conceptually is how this would work. A laser beam excites a parametric down conversion. One photon is a signal, the other is the idler photon. The signal photon passes through an object, but then through some aberration. Uh, it is not a good optical imaging system of this side. And then the, uh, uh, the CCD camera measures this aberrated image. Now, uh, over in the idler port, the question is, can I put, if I think I know the nature of this aberration, can I put the conjugate of that aberration here to correct for the image 
when measured in, in coincidence. So uh, just so we don't forget, uh, I repeated the, uh, the last figure here. Okay, now, when you think about this question, it's reminiscent of, for instance, dispersion cancellation, which occurs in the time domain. So uh, in a sense, what we are proposing to do here is the spatial domain analog of Franson's dispersion cancellation of the time domain. You see both of them are uh, described by a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And the, uh, uh, the dispersion uh, in the time domain gets replaced by diffraction in the spatial domain. So uh, this analogy is so strong. Let's remind ourselves how Franson's dispersion cancellation works. So uh, here would be the conceptual laboratory setup. We have uh, a laser that produces pulse. We split them into two. One pulse enters this optical fiber, passes through uh, a, uh, uh, a dispersive material. This beta is the magnitude of the dispersion of this material. The, the pulse gets spread out. Uh, falls onto a, uh, uh, a, a photo detector. Uh, same thing for the other pulse. Uh, it, it passes through, an, uh, through the idler uh, dispersion characteristic. We, we measure in coincidence, and we can do this as a function of the time delay here. So what would we expect to see? Well, if there were no uh, if, if there was no dispersion in either arm, we would see this blue curve here. When uh, either or both of the signal and idler arms has a non-zero dispersion, we expect the pulse to broaden out. And the width of this broadened pulse uh, we call uh, sigma tau. Now, uh, through some theory, and let's not go through the theory right now because we don't have time, uh, you can work out how broad this pulse is going to be. And the classical result is that uh, the spread of the final uh, pulse depends on the square of the, uh, of the GVD parameter for the signal plus the square of the GVD parameter for the idler. However, if instead you do this with quantum uh, correlated photons, you take the sum of beta S with beta I and then the square. Now, beta S could have the opposite sign from beta I, so there's a possibility for, for cancellation. Uh, and, and this uh, is proposed by France and has now been uh, verified experimentally. So our experiment is similar to this, but it's in the spatial domain. And in particular, we replace the dispersive elements here. We, we, dis we replace the dispersive elements uh, with, with wavefront aberra aberrators and uh, measure how the transverse structure of the pulse gets, gets modified. So here are some laboratory results. First of all, if there are no aberrations present, you see that the photons are, the signal and the idler are very strongly entangled. You see that, well, here's the idler position, here's the signal position, and you see that they're very, very strongly correlated. The momentum is very, very strongly uh, anti-correlated. Uh, we quantify this by looking at the uh, uncertainty product. And the uncertainty product, uh, delta x squared, delta p squared, is 0 0.026, which is much less than a quarter, so we know that they're entangled. If we place an aberrator in the idler arm, uh, the uh, position, uh, the, the momentum remains correlated, but the position does not. It loses the correlation. If we uh, Sorry, if we place an aberration in the signal arm only, we also get distortion in position space. If we do two of them simultaneously, we get back to a situation which is almost as good as what we started with. And quantitatively, when we put the aberration in the idler only, only we do not meet the Mancini criterion. When we place it in the app, in the signal only, we do not uh, uh, fulfill the Mancini uh, criterion, but uh, we do get the, uh, but we do get it back. If we put uh, both aberrations, we get the cancellation. 
and we once again can confirm that we have uh, that we have entanglement. Now, uh, what about a real image, a real object? Uh, can we put a real object in one arm and put aberrations and get back the image of this object? So we chose a very simple object. This is three gold uh, uh, bars on top of a substrate. So this would uh, this, this would block out light in three different places. Now, when there's no aberrations at all, here's our coincidence count. And you see that it drops to zero here and here and here. When we put uh, aberrations in the signal beam only, we no longer see three uh, dips in the signal, but we can, uh, uh, but when we compensate, uh, when we compensate them, you see that once again, we get back to this structure that shows three, uh, uh, three dark regions. So uh, we, we uh, so the aberration cancellation works even for a real object. So uh, here I just uh, want to point out that many people have worked on aberration correction before ourselves. Ours is just a little bit different in terms of uh, uh, whether it works on both odd order or, or even order uh, cancellation. So conclusions is that we've demonstrated the effect of aberrations on transverse entanglement of photons. It's perhaps not surprising that aberrations would lead to an apparent loss of entanglement, but uh, it was good to, to demonstrate it. Uh, we also observe simultaneously even an odd order non-local aberration cancellation. And we observe the non-local cancellation of defocus in the quantum imaging uh, uh, setup. So the aberration we were using there was just defocus. So I want to thank my collaborators who were with me on this work. And this work was published last summer in Physical Review Letters. Now, let me move to the last part of the talk. This is on quantum ghost imaging. So uh, how does quantum ghost imaging work? Well, uh, here is uh, a conceptual diagram. Again, we have a nonlinear crystal, a laser beam. Down conversion occurs we get an entangled photon pair. Uh, one photon interrogates some object. If the photon gets uh, transmitted through the object, it hits what we call a bucket detector. There is no spatial resolution in this detector. The, the, uh, the detector either goes click or doesn't go click, depending on whether this photon was made it to the detector or did not. Down here, we have a photo detect detector array and we allow this photon to fall into the array. Since the two photons are entangled, the position of this photon tells us what part of the object up here was interrogated. And uh, it works. Uh, here are some stencils uh, showing the type of uh, images that one can obtain. So this has obvious applicability to remote sensing, uh, and people have looked at it uh, very extensively uh, from that point of view. I believe that the most important application of ghost imaging is for two color ghost imaging. I'd like to turn to talk directly about that. So uh, new possibilities are afforded by using different colors in the object and reference arms. So uh, let's say we take our parameter down conversion and arrange our nonlinear crystal so that the uh, the down conversion is non-degenerate. Let's say you produce a green photon and a red photon. And then you can, uh, for example, here's your bucket detector, here's your object. Let's say that you interrogate the object with the green photon, but you uh, send the red photon to your uh, CCD camera. So this allows you to uh, uh, capture an image of what this object looks like at a wavelength that is different from the wavelength of the light that your CCD camera can respond to. So uh, I worked uh, uh, on this project with Miles Paget. We collaborate on many things. Uh, here is the project that we worked on. So the uh, the pump laser works at 350 nanometers. We produce by down conversion a signal at 460 and either at uh, 1550 nanometers. So uh, a dichroic beam splitter here. 
we uh, we take the uh, uh, we take the blue photon. Uh, we send it through an image preserving delay line. We take the red photon. It passes through the object and falls onto a detector. When the detector goes click, that means that we we know that there's a photon over here. We send the trigger signal uh, to our ICCD camera. These cameras take uh, tens of nanoseconds to uh, uh, for for the gate pulse to, to tell the camera to turn on. It takes tens of nanoseconds. That's why we had to have a delay line here. And here are some typical images. So uh, the these uh, the image forming part was taken with a uh, CCD camera but it tells us what the object looked like at 1.55 microns, where a CCD camera uh, cannot work. Okay, next topic is quantum imaging by interaction-free measurement. Uh, maybe you've heard about this, maybe you haven't. Let's assume you have an interferometer and a single photon, a Fox state, enters the interferometer. You've adjusted the path lengths so that always the photon exits here, it will never exit here. But now, let's say you put, a, uh, you put some object in this arm that blocks, the, uh, uh, the, that blocks this path. What you find then is that half the time you get a click here and half the time you get a click here. So at one level that's obvious, but at another level is very, very subtle because this tells us that we can, with absolute certainty, deduce the presence of an object here. But we can also, with absolute certainty, say that the photon didn't hit the object, because if the photon hit the object, the photon would not be present to allow one of these detectors to click. So it, it, it raises conceptual questions in uh, quantum measurement theory. So uh, if uh, you can do this, then uh, Andrew White and his collaborators turned this into an imaging setup. So uh, the same conceptual idea here. You translate an object uh, through, the, uh, uh, through the focal region of, of one of the beams. Uh, and here's what the results would look like. So again, this is the image of the object taken with light that you know never interacted with the object. And you see that there's a very, very strong dip here where uh, the uh, object removed photons from, from the light path. Now, uh, this started my colleagues uh, and me thinking, uh, said, what if we combine interaction-free measurements with entangled photons? Let's say we have two spatially entangled photons. Uh, one photon just falls onto a photodetector array. The other photon enters this uh, interferometer. And now we put a small opaque object inside this arm of the interferometer. So, if this photon clicks, we know that this photon here interacted with the light. Question is, will this detector array see a small spot of light or a large spot of light? Uh, or to ask it differently, does an interaction-free measurement constitute a real measurement? Does it lead to the collapse of the wave function of the entangled partner? Or more precisely, does the entire two photon wave function collapse when this photon uh, interrogates this object and causes this detector to click? So uh, we found that conceptually interesting. Uh, uh, Ebrin Karimi and I set out to do this experiment. So uh, it's the interaction free ghost image of a straight wire. So uh, without going through all the details, here are the singles counts, here are the coincidence counts. And while there's some background, you see an image of the wire here. Uh, you, you see the image of the wire here, and it is uh, smaller than the entire background. So note that the interaction free ghost image is about five times narrower than the full spot on the ICC camera. And this result shows that interaction-free measurements lead to wave function collapse, just as standard measurements do. So the uh, question is, is interaction-free imaging useful? Well, I think it could be. 
because literally interaction-free imaging allows us to see what something looks like in the dark. Now there are objects in biophysics that react to light. So uh, when you take a picture of something, uh, you, you know what it looks like when light falls upon it. But uh, the question is, what does it look like when light did not fall upon it? This uh, interaction-free imaging it could be very useful for that application. So uh, I think my time is up. So uh, I want especially to thank the members of my group. Here are the members of my Ottawa group, and here are the members of my Rochester group. And I want to thank all of you for your kind attention during my talk. Goodbye.